Psalms 107. And we're going to read from verse 23 to 31. Psalms 107, verse 23 to 31. Now, I've entitled this message, Ship Ahoy. Now, I gotta say I'm not really the best at uh, spiritual applicated messages. Uh, I'll do my best with it. Um, there's a lot of men that can preach this a lot better than I could. But as long as you get the points, that's what counts. And the, uh, pray God give you that. But Psalm 107, verse 23 to 31. It says, They that go down uh, to the ships and uh, go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the ways thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now. Father, may we see how uh, the picture here of uh, a man's life is like being on a the big wide open sea, Lord, and there's just uh, many perils and things that happen, but also, Lord, you're there in the storm. I pray, Father, we see the applications here, and Lord, the things that we need to survive the sea of life, and Lord, that you would bless now the message, and I ask these things uh, for Jesus' sake, and Father, for those prayer requests that were made, I pray that you'd answer everyone according to your will, and Lord, we'll, we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Life is like a, just like a great voyage on a sea of an unimaginable size and depth. Now, I've, uh, I've probably flown over the ocean more than I've ever been in it. I've been on it a couple times, and uh, I've dipped my toe in it a few times. I didn't care for it. <coughs> you know, I walked out there, especially at night. You know, we, we went out there uh, on the beach in Florida, and Robbie took us out there, you know, and there was all this seaweed coming in, you know, and... Uh, and I, of course, I couldn't see. I was up to my, about to my knees and uh, just, just got this feeling that something was watching me. I knew it was Jaws. And, uh, or there was these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, them, them, uh, jelly, jellyfish, them gooey things that touch up to you and sting you real bad, you know. And I just couldn't get past that, you know. I, so I, I really don't care. I don't care for beaches. I don't care for sand. I hate sand. Um, I don't care for uh, uh, being on, being walking in the ocean. Now, I didn't mind sailing on it or being on the ocean. Uh, I took my wife on a cruise one time, and uh, we had a great time. We did some snorkeling, and again, I didn't really care about being so much uh, in the ocean. It's so salty, and I can't keep from getting it in my mouth and down my throat because <laughs> so there are some things about it that just were unpalatable, but you know. He says there, they that, uh, they that go down to the sea in ships and do business in great waters. That's how your life is like. You know, you find yourself out there in the sea and, and you're just kind of sailing around doing business. But, you know, if you've ever been out there, you know how vast it is. You know, there's something about, there, there, there's just something about being on, on, on the ocean and looking out there at that vastness. It's absolutely scary. It's frightening because you realize, you know, except for that vessel that you're standing on that's floating under your feet, you're gone. And there's nobody to yell to. There's nobody to holler out to. I mean, it's just you're in the middle of nowhere. And life can get like that. You find yourself out there, you know, some people find themselves out there without anybody to call. Nobody to help. A lot of people like that. I feel for them. I wouldn't be them for nothing. I've always got somebody I can call on. And he can hear me from any place where I am on earth. Doesn't matter how deep the cave. Doesn't matter how high the balloon or whatever I happen to be up in, a plane. God can hear me. If I'm on a space shuttle, he can hear me there. If I'm in the depths of the sea, he can hear me there. There's no place I can't go that I can't call on my God. And I like that. A lot of people don't have that. It says uh, uh, they see the works of the Lord as wonders in the deep. 
It says, for he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind. He said, why would God do that? Well, it's the only way you can get your attention. If you want to know why things, things come at you in life, you want to know why things pound you, and they just, I mean, wave after wave. You ever had that happen? Where you know, It's like, you know, now Job knew what that was like because it did come wave after wave. But you probably know what that's like too. You know more and hear about one problem. Here comes, you know, one, two, three more right after it. And God's got your attention, man, because I'll tell you what, if you're saved, the first thing you want to do is go to prayer. I need to pray about this. <laughs> and if the first one didn't make you want to pray, after you hit the second or third one, then you said, I'm ready to pray. <laughs> he can get your attention. Uh, it says they mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. That's the waves. Um, I can't even fathom. I never, oh, I can't, it, it, it brings the hair stand on the back of my neck, think about it, to be on a ship where these waves are towering over you by, I mean, 60, 70 feet. Can you even imagine that? And then going down like you're going into a valley and then, and then coming, I just can't even imagine but there are waves like that. And there are people that have been on the sea uh, of life and also on the real sea and experienced those things. And it's scary. It's scary. It says they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. You can't, you can't walk on a boat and when there's waves going on, you're just getting thrown back and forth and you're staggering just like a drunken man. You've got no footing. Sometimes in life when things are hitting you, you just don't have any footing. You find yourself off balance. It says, at their wit's end. That's where that expression comes from. The Bible. They're at their wit's end. Man, there's been a few times in my life I've been at my wit's end. I think God tries to bring a man to his wit's end on the sea of life. So what? That he'll call upon the Lord. It says, then, then. They cry unto the Lord in their trouble. That's when people call on God. Uh, listen, as long as the sun's shining and the birds are singing and everything's wonderful, you'll never call on Him. I mean, if you don't already know Him, you won't. You have no reason to. Only in their trouble do they call Him. And He says, He bringeth them out of their distresses. <laughs> you might want to add that He caused a lot of them. <laughs> the distresses. The waves and the storm. He maketh the storm a calm. The one that caused the storm can calm the storm. Good to know. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. Nothing like a calm sea. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. Safe harbor. That's where you want to land. You want to land in safe harbor. And sometimes getting there, man, it's perilous. For the lost, you're in danger every second. Every second of your life without Christ, you're in danger. That you will not, you will not uh, wind up in that desired haven. If you're saved, you will make that haven one way or another, but you will make it. God will get you to safe haven. He will get you to safe harbor. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. So life's just like a great voyage on a sea. And it's unimaginable in size and depth. You never know what's going to happen. 70% of our planet is covered in water. 139.4 million square miles. Versus the land, it's only 57.5 million square miles. So they said 70% water. The average depth, this kind of scared me. Okay, I've been out on a lake, you know, where I jumped overboard and the, and the depth was 120 feet and it was unimaginable to me. The average depth in the ocean is 12,430 feet. If you don't know what that is, that's about two and a half miles deep. Man, that's deep. <laughs> I thought 100 feet was deep. You can imagine 12,000 feet, man. And the thing is, you don't, there's, no predicting, there's, no, there's no predicting what can happen to you on the water. I mean, if you, any sailor knows that. Is it one minute, be calm, the next minute, you're, you're fighting for your life. You're fighting to keep that boat from sinking or that ship from sinking. Proverbs 27.1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You just don't know. It's calm seas right now. But we could be looking out the window and next thing you know, man, the wind's blowing. There's something coming at us, maybe a tornado. <laughs> Who knows what can happen? I don't know what's going to happen today. 
It could go from calm to absolutely at my wit's end. <laughs> I hope not. But there are some things you got to have um, for you to make safe harbor. These are, these are just things you got to have if you're going to... Listen, if you're going to be on the sea of life, this is what you need. The first thing is you got to have the right captain. Amen? I mean, if you're going to get out there, man, don't get some, you know, some clown. Uh, don't get an Italian captain, okay? You know, you know that guy, you know, he, was a, he wanted to impress some woman... You know, the, the one that had the cruise ship, impressing some woman, you know, he wanted to be able, and he ran at a bar and flipped the thing over. And a lot of people lost their lives. There are quite a few lost their life because of him. And he was the first one off the boat, or among the first, to get off that boat. You're supposed to go down with your ship, you know? Not that captain. I'd stay away from Italian captains. I'd stay away from anyone from Rome, too. I wouldn't have any of them as my captain. Okay. You probably get that if you think about it just a little bit. Um, you, want, you want a capable captain at the helm. Uh, you're not capable at the helm. I'll, I'll just tell you that right now. I know some people say, I want, uh, I want uh, God as my co-pilot. Well, he refuses to be your co-pilot. Either, either he's, he's at the controls and at the helm, or, the, or you're the one there. And I wouldn't give you five cents for where you're going to end up at that point. There's no telling. You might sail around in circles. Uh, you need a capable uh, captain at the helm. Hebrews 2.10 says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by him are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. You see, my captain, perfect. You're not going to find a more perfect captain than Jesus Christ. You know, in 2 Chronicles 13.12, that's a little tucked away there in 2 Chronicles, it says, And behold, God himself is with us for our captain. He's with me. He's my captain. Now, Christian, that doesn't mean you've got him at the helm. Huh? You could still be... No, I got it. You could still be at the helm. Just because you've accepted him and got, he's on board, maybe you've confined him to quarters. And you're the one at the helm. That's not good. Um... Your captain better be in the wheelhouse. And the wheelhouse is where the helm is, and, and, and it's where that boat's being, uh, that ship or that boat's being guided. That's where your captain better be. You better have a captain that can do more than just sail the seven seas. He better be able to calm them. It's one thing to know how to sail, but even the best captain, man, in, in, in uh, troubled waters and dangerous waters, uh, he may not be able to, this captain can handle it. If it gets too rough, he just says, peace be still. I like that kind of captain. In Mark chapter 4, verse 37 to 41, there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the, hind, uh, the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. I think this is hilarious to me. I mean, he's asleep in the hold. The Lord is. <laughs> and they awake him and say to him, Master? Yeah, I can just see this, this look on their face. They're all drenched with water. They're down there looking at him, dripping all over the pillow. He says, Master cares not that we perish. We're dying up here. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said into the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And they're just like, I mean, they're like, whoa, what kind of man is this? And he said unto them, after he gets done rebuking the wind, he rebukes them. He says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And you know, when you read that, you say it's kind of a, you know, oh, that's a wonderful platitude. No, no. no. He says, why are you so fearful? Guess who's in the boat with you? The creator? In the hold? You think I'm going to drown myself? You think I'm going to let this thing go under when I'm down in the hold asleep on a pillow? Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? Could you at least believe? I'd have just sat out. I'd have sat, you know what? I'd have went to sleep right next to him. I said, I'm, I'm going down the hole. Yeah, me too. You know, if this thing's going to go down, we'll go down with him. But how can it go down with the crater on the boat? So he says, why are you so fearful? Look, my captain's not worried about the thing going down. He's on the boat. If you're saved, he's on the boat with you. You're not going down. You're going up. 
Not only do you have to have the right captain, you have to have the right charts. I mean, you know, you've got to chart, uh, you have to chart a course through troubled waters. And that's obviously going to be the Bible. Psalm 109, uh, or Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you're going to chart your course through troubled waters, you need the Bible. It will help you. It will stop. It will help you to see the pitfalls. It'll help you see the, the, uh, the shallows, the deeps, uh, the shoreline, or the, uh, what do you call those things that uh, the people run into in crash ships? Sandbars? Reefs. It'll help you see the reefs. The Bible warns you about all the pitfalls of things. It's, it's a great for charting your course. You can't make it without that. To arrive safely and in good shape, we must follow the Bible route. In Psalm 1611, he says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Following the course or path that God gives you may not be trouble-free. I tell folks when they get saved, I said, you know, actually the trouble's not over, it's just began. <laughs> I mean, you know, to think that you're going to have a trouble-free life just because you're saved, are you kidding me? You've got more enemies now than you ever had. You, you've, got, you've got more people that want to see your life disintegrate and fall apart than ever. You have a being out there that wants to destroy you. He, seek, he goeth about seeking whom he may devour. So you got enemies. And you're going to have trouble. Listen, the disciples were out there and the storm came anyway, even though the Creator's in the bottom of the boat to sleep. It still came. He still let it happen. The thing is, he's trying to tell you that, look, as long as you've got me, don't worry about the storm. Don't worry about it. And if it gets too, if it gets too big, if it gets too great, I can call... Listen... You ever, you ever had everything just going crazy around you? Just, you just like, then all of a sudden the Lord just says, peace be still. And inside here, I mean, you got peace. It's amazing how God can just do that. Peace be still. While the, the world around you may be burning. Or the boat, <laughs> you might feel like the boat's sinking. Um, it's not trouble free. But you will arrive in safe harbor in good shape. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8, uh, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. In other words, he followed the course that God gave him. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. So you need, you need uh, good charts. Following, listen, if you follow the charts that this world gives you, the course of this world, it ends in destruction. He said in Ephesians 2, 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. You want to follow their course. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now I used to think the world had some sense at one time. I don't know why. Maybe I, my parents told me that. Or maybe I was raised to think that, you know, somebody knew what they were doing. I know for an absolute fact they have no idea what they're doing. I know they don't. When that Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness, it doesn't take too long for you to just take a look at it and go, man, this thing's a mess. They don't know what they're doing. And they are going, it is, it is going to wind up, can you, here's how bad it gets. The devil winds up in charge. And everybody says, yay, we finally got somebody we really want. <laughs> and then there's, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Literally, that's where the world's going. We can see it. We can see it now. Can you see it clearly now, how it's going? Just when you think, you know, wow, man, things are really looking good. And then, then you know, the next day, the next week, it's not years, it's not decades. It's days. The whole world falls apart. And you're wondering, can it get more dangerous? It absolutely can. We are in troubled waters. Not only do you have to have, um, not only do you have to have good charts, you have to have the Bible. You have to have the right instruments to guide you. Um, charts don't mean anything if you don't have 
if you don't know where you're at, <laughs> there's, uh, there's two things that they use on a ship, at least they used to. Uh, listen, I still believe in these things. If I, were, if I were going to be a sailor, I would make sure I knew how to use a compass. And I've tried. Lord knows how ignorant I am. I got lost in my own backyard one time. I was just going to plot a course, you know, and it's supposed to bring me back around. It didn't. So, so I've got one of them uh, battery power ones, you know, that tells me what the, the, the waypoints, you know. I mean, if, in case I get out there, I keep it as a, if I ever have to leave, I've got to take that thing with me. I'll get lost going around the corner. Um, but a compass uh, or a sextant, and uh, the reason it's called a, a sextant, the word, the Latin word for six is sex. And it works on a 60 degree slope where you triangulate your position out there when you're at sea. And without those two things, I mean, uh, you're going to get lost. I'll bring up something else here in a second. Let me give you these verse. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. There's the chart. He will guide you into all truth. And he says, Sanctify them through thy word. Uh, thy word is truth. Did I quote that right? Thy word is truth. I thought I was off here a little bit. But he says, He will guide you into all truth, for he shall speak, not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he, uh, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He'll show you the, 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 the obstacles and the things that are up ahead. Things to come. He'll show you the future. You can't get any better than that. As far as a guide... Now, the compass will always point you toward God. Did you know that? If you've got a compass, I guarantee it points toward God. They all do. Which way do they point? They point north. You know where God is? He's north. Psalm 75, 6 and 7, he says, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God. In the place of the north. But God is the judge. He put it down one. He setteth up another. And then there's another verse. And I can give you several more. But I'm just going to give you this one. Psalm 48, 1 and 2. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. The city of the great king. We talked about there where, um, didn't Satan say, I will send the sides of the north? Huh? You say, where's God? He's north. Uh, if you can find the north star in that direction, if you could make it, if you could live long enough, if you had a spaceship that had the power uh, to go, I don't know, 100 times the speed of light, you, if you made it to the very edge of our universe, huh? you, you would wind up at a place where, the, where the, um, it's a sea of glass where it's frozen. As Doc would say, it's absolute Kelvin. No molecular movement. And that would be where Mount Zion is. It's a physical place. God's in a physical place. He made it. He doesn't have to have it. But I guess some angels need something to stand on. Okay? And that thing's there. You say, where is it? It's north. Because every time you find it, it's north. Do you know where up compass points? It points toward God. Now, the sextant uses a 60-degree arc to triangulate your position. Do you know what they use that? You know mainly what the sextant is used? It's used in the daytime with the sun. It can be used at night with the moon and the stars. You know what that tells me? Heaven has to be your guide. If you're going to make it through the storms of this life, heaven's got to be your guide, not the earth. Not man. You're going to have to look to the heavens or to find out where you're at and where you're going. So without the Holy Spirit leading and guiding, the charts will not make much sense. I'll tell you, if, if you've ever tried reading this book as a lost man, it didn't go over very well. I mean, I read a few pages out and thought, what in the world is this? Threw it across the room. Just a bunch of, just, oh, can't make any sense of this. Boy, after I got saved, I started opening her up. But this time I had a guide. Man, it's. Not only did it make sense, it was like, whoa, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Whoa, I didn't know that was in the Bible. 
The Holy Spirit is an infallible guide for those committed to the truth. He'll never steer you wrong. If you love the truth, say, Lord, I'm open to the truth, whatever it is. Just show me what it is. Don't care if it's even against me. You've got to be that way. You've got you to accept the fact that it, the, truth, the truth might be against you. It might chafe you raw, but it's still the truth. And that's, that's rough sometimes. Sometimes just reading through there, it's like, oh, man. Lord, that one's killing me right there. That one's got me. That one's... Mm. But it's still the truth. A lot of people, they just don't... They just shut out anything they don't want to hear. They cherry-pick the Bible for all those wonderful verses. This is the day that the Lord hath created. Let us be... You know, that's a great verse! But it's not the only one in the Bible. And there's, there's one day that he creates, the Bible says, is gloomy and darkness. and I mean, It's a horrible day. And God created that one too. You've got to have the right instruments. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. You know one thing I know about a compass and a sextant? Neither one of them needs a battery. <laughs> Neither one of them needs a satellite. There's something to be said about the old ways. I tell you, if I was out to sea and all of a sudden, you know, the, the Duracell, you know, <laughs> you know, ran out, you know, on my little, <laughs> I'm lost, you know. What are you going to do then? But a compass, I mean, as long as you haven't broke the thing, the thing will always work. The sextant, always, you can always get a line on, sooner or later you're going to get a line on the sun or you're going to get a line on the stars or the moon. You're going to be able to fix, fix, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, you're going, to, you're going to be able to look into the heavens and find out what's going on. Get a fix. you got to have the right instruments. you got to have a sail to catch the wind. Uh, I'm probably too chicken, but I, if, I, I, I would love to be out on a ship with sails. Not, not a, not a, not a, don't get me, misunderstand me. Not a sailboat. I've seen too many people get knocked off those things. <laughs> I'm talking about a ship that sails with sails. Okay, I would. I think you can. Do, uh, you can do it. Probably have to pay a lot of money, but I think that would be a wonderful thing to experience. Do you know that Proverbs 30 backs that up? It says there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not: the way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, and the third one is the way of a ship in the midst of the sea. And I thought about that. And I thought, you know, when that wind's blowing, yeah, you know, it's like spirit, you know, that wind's blowing, and you put up them sails, and they just catch that thing, and all of a sudden that ship is just moving through that water, and you just, just rise and fall. I mean, it's not battery powered, it's not nuclear powered, it's powered by the wind. And a sail catches that wind. I, I can understand how he says that'd be too wonderful. The way that thing moves and cuts through that water. What a thing to experience. But you know that's what it's like when the Holy Spirit, and you've caught the wind, man. You've got the sail. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's things here. It says, uh, Hebrews 11, 32 to 39 says, What shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of, and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith... Subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had uh, trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. They, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, or saw on a Sunday, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. But you see, I did. I've already received the promise. The promise of the resurrection. I've got that. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. All I got to do is make sure my sail is up and catches the wind. These, these, these men did 
great things for God. And there's no reason why we can't do great things. Did not Jesus Christ say, greater works shall you do than the, than, than the works that he did? That's what he said. Listen, every time you lead a soul to Jesus Christ, you've done a greater work than he did. Jesus Christ could tell, talk about being born again in John chapter 3, but nobody is born again while he is there. He said, if I don't leave, the Comforter won't come. Listen, that's where the new birth takes place. With the Comforter, with the Holy Spirit. So he had to leave. So when you win somebody to Jesus Christ, it's a greater work than what he did. Praise the Lord. So you've got to have a sail to catch the wind. You've got to have an anchor to keep, the, uh, keep from drifting off course. Uh, Hebrews 6, 19 says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. The, the hope in the Bible is the resurrection. So he says there in Titus 2, 13, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope is the resurrection. You know when that happens? When you see the Savior. That's what happens at the rapture. It says the dead are raised incorruptible. And the, those that are alive are changed. But that's when you see the Lord. So we have the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It happens at the same time. You see, what is that? That's my anchor. <laughs> that's my anchor. Listen, without that thing, whew, I don't know how I could function. If I didn't believe the Lord was coming back, I don't know how I, I, don't know how I continue with this ministry. If I didn't believe the Lord Jesus Christ was coming back and his return was imminent. Imminent. Because without that, let's face it, man, you don't have much hope. Do you want to imagine what it's going to be like 10 years from today in this world? Do you want to imagine what your country is going to be like? You want to imagine where you'll be? You want to imagine whether you're poverty stricken or not? I already imagine where I'll be 10 years from today. I'll be back here uh, uh, starting the millennium. <laughs> I'll be back here for the millennium. You see, the hope of the rapture is what keeps us from drifting. He said there in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. If you're saved, you're son of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. God knows these, these bodies of ours are breaking down. But we know that when He shall appear... When's that? The rapture, right? We shall be like him. You know what David said? He said, I'll finally be satisfied. Why? When I, when I, um, how's it go? When I appear with thy likeness or, ah, I messed it up. When I awake with thy likeness, that's it. I'll finally be satisfied when I awake with Jesus Christ's likeness. It says, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. Kind of keeps you on a... When man, when you, if you thought, man, the rapture could happen, it could happen at any time, but it could happen, maybe it'll happen this spring, maybe it'll happen next spring. Next spring. You're thinking about that the whole time, saying, man, I gotta, I gotta get on with this thing. I gotta start doing, I gotta talk to somebody. There's somebody I need to get, there's somebody I need to reach, there's somebody I need to witness to. There's some Bible I need to get to reading. Are you, you going to face God you've never read the Bible through? Come on! If you've never read your Bible through at least once, you need to. Every word. You see all them names? Yeah, all them names. Because Laura said, I wrote you a book. Did you read it? Well, I read parts of it. He said, well, that's why you got parts wrong. You didn't read the whole thing. Last thing is, you got to be on board the ship, the old ship of Zion, before you can sail. Problem is, look, most people, they're not even on the ship. They're not on board. They're out there doing their own thing, man, and they're, and they're, they're in a vessel. They're the vessel. But what is it on a sea of life? What is it on troubled seas? It's like being in a little dinghy or a little boat out there in, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Talk about scary. And listen, you can be scared to death on a cruise ship out on the ocean. Those things are huge. There's container ships that have went down. You ever seen how big them things are? 
They're like a floating city, man. You got these things piled up on there, all these containers. I look like little bitty, little bitty blocks on them things. They're huge. God toppled them things right over. They've gone down. I can't imagine being out there in this vessel out there on that sea. No way. I'm glad I got the right captain. I'm glad I'm on the vessel. I'm on the old ship of Zion. If you're, if, if you're sailing in just this vessel, you'll face disaster and loss of soul. You know, what they, you know what they say when a ship goes down? They count lost souls. That's how they count them. Mark 8.36 says, For what should it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The Christian who will not yield to the Lord's leading will end up shipwrecking their faith, though. Remember I said, you're going to make it to safe harbor, but not before you've wrecked the thing, and, and uh, you, may, you may come in with a totaled ship. <laughs> in 1 Timothy 1.19, he says, holding faith. Well, this is the body of revealed truth right here. This is the faith. You know that, right? Holding faith and a good conscience. Which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Don't want to wreck that ship. You want to get into port in, in good condition. He will get you home. That's God's promise. Now the condition you're going to be in when you get there, there may be some wrinkles that need to be ironed out. We call that the judgment seat of Christ. Man, you want to go with as little baggage as possible. You don't want to carry the sins. And not so much the sins, but listen, the sins are paid for. But you know what? One thing I know for sure, if you're sinning, you are not serving. If you are sinning, you are not in church. Or at least you're halfway in church. If you're in the world after the things of the world, you are not after the things of God. And guess what? You are going to suffer loss, the Bible says. You're going to suffer loss. Now, I thought about us singing Ship Ahoy. I don't think anyone can sing this song more uh, or better than Buddy Blanco. So I'm just going to read the, uh, the, the things here, and then I'm going to have, uh, have an invitation. Um, I love this song. I wish I could sing it, but I can't, but I'll read it. It says, I was drifting away on life's pitiful sea, or pitiless sea, and the angry waves threatened my ruin to be. Then away at my side, where I dimly descried a stately old vessel, and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy. T'was the old ship of Zion thus sailing along. All aboard her seemed joyous, I heard their sweet song. And the captain's kind ear, ever ready to hear, caught my wail of distress as I cried out in fear, Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, as I cried out in fear, Ship ahoy. The good captain commanded a boat to be lowered, and with tender compassion he took me on board. And I'm happy today, all my sins washed away in the blood of my Savior, and now I can say, Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, from my soul I can say, Bless the Lord. O oh, soul sinking down these sins' merciless wave, the strong arm of our captain is mighty to save. Then trust him today, no longer delay, board the old ship of Zion and shout on your way. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout and sing on your way, Jesus saves. Let's all stand. Brother, you come, come ahead. I've asked him to sing, All the way my Savior leads me.